So I'm here with uh, Mark from MJ Aquascaping, uh, most notably on YouTube, uh, but also on Instagram. And uh, Mark is Dutch, and his last That's name right. his last name is also Dutch. <laughs> so, in the pre-show conversation, we decided that uh, he's best known as MJ Aquascaping yeah. or as Mark. So. Um, that's, that's what we're going to stick with today. But, uh, how are you, Mark? Very good. Very good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Most definitely. How, um, how are you? I'm really good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so, uh, I've been watching, I've known about you for quite a while now, and I've been watching your, uh, YouTube channel also. Um, you've been watching my channel. I've been watching your channel. Yes. Uh, really? Yes. I mean, I'm always keeping an eye on just who's who's sort of doing what out there and uh, this kind of thing. So, I mean, and I'm I might be looking at it at it sometimes through a slightly different lens. Uh, in that, I too at one time uh, sought to be a content creator, and yeah. uh, it's I I know I've been saying this a lot on the podcast when I've had other aquarium related. Uh, content creators on but uh i I don't think it can be stated enough it's it's a lot of work it is definitely this is this is uh i when i look at your channel your output what you're doing uh very high quality and you've definitely got a flow you know it's a real flow to things there and that's that's very noticeable um it is a lot of work it it is definitely it's something i can and it's why I'm sort of attracted to the content creators just for conversation purposes, because there's no way to do it without being very passionate. Uh, you have to oh, yeah. really love, you have to really love this or just not, you know, nobody would keep it up because it, it's, um, it's, it's a lot and, um, you do an excellent job with it. Um, so I'm always curious, uh, just how you came to be, uh, a content creator in the aquarium segment. How did I came to be a content creator? Um, I think my, uh, my other significant half kind of pushed me into it. Okay. I think, uh, behind every strong man, there's always a strong partner as well. Was kind of, you know, giving that nudge. Yeah. So, um, I think I kind of started an Instagram account by myself, but, um, yeah, I think my, my girlfriend, she kind of pushed me like, Hey, you should start making YouTube videos as well. So, um, I owe a lot to her really, but yeah, I started, I think I started on Instagram around 2018. <clears throat> That's, I think it was just three years into my aquascaping journey, mm-hmm. sort of started to get good at it as well. And kind of just wanted to connect with other, uh, hobby enthusiasts, you know, just kind of chat with other people because it's a very niche hobby. So it's not like you can talk to your neighbor about your, or you, you can find somebody, somebody in your neighborhood who has aquascape as well. Right. Very true. It's still a very, very small hobby. Um, so I started an Instagram account in 2018, I think it was March, 2018. And I started growing a, a decent following. I was just consistent, consistently posting just updates on my tanks. And because my following was growing, I was also getting quite a lot of questions because people saw that my things look good and they wanted to know how they can achieve the same results. So like I was getting a bunch of questions about how to grow healthy plants, how to deal with algae, how to anything, how to set up a CO2 system, stuff like that, you know? And okay, I I thought, okay, that's fun. You know, like I enjoy helping people out, people out. But the more I was growing, the more the questions were coming in and it was literally becoming almost like a full-time job, just replying to everybody, you know? So I thought there has to be a, a better way of, of doing this. And I think uh, it was like early, like late 2019 when, when COVID came, uh, that's when I lost my job basically. So okay. that's, I just had a lot of, I had a lot of free time. So I thought, okay, like this is, you know, this is the moment where you, you start making YouTube videos. 
It's like, I'm not going to sit around at home doing nothing. So that's when I picked up a camera and I started just uploading. Yeah. Just answers to those questions. You no, know, starting with the basic stuff, um, LG, LG tutorials, uh, simple things. And yeah, fast forward three years later now, it's, uh, become my full-time, uh, full-time job actually. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. I think definitely the, uh, the pandemic situation was a time of obviously just a big pivot for many people. Um, and I, you know, I think it's cool when you can actually turn that into something that is pursuing something that's clearly a passion or, uh, you know, a, a, a thing we would probably rather be doing than, than the day job situation anyway, which you know, aquariums <laughs> have a way of being one of those kinds of hobbies. Um, yeah. because you try to imagine it as what, a, what possible career could I really have doing this? Um, there's all these notions about doing what you love and, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. These sayings and yeah. all of this, but <laughs> exactly. the aquarium is, is a challenging situation. I, and I, I'm always, I'm curious if it's, if your perception is of it being a different situation in Europe where maybe there's more opportunity and sort of the industry side of it. But, you know, the, the industry is different from content creation in terms of, I think, pursuing one's kind of passion or their sense of being kind of their own brand. Um, did you ever consider any sort of career in it maybe after you started to get into it or was it just sort of this natural evolution to making videos and posting online? No, no, for sure. I mean, I've basically been in the aquarium hobby my entire life. Okay. And so I always had this idea of like, uh, or these thoughts in my head, like, how can I turn this hobby into something more, you know? So of course there were always thoughts like maybe I should open my own aquarium shop or maybe I should open my own fish shop. Um, I even thought about, um, just, just before the pandemic hit, I thought about doing like an online aquarium shop just uh, sure. aquascaping aquascaping related but especially here in the netherlands like there's an aquarium shop <laughs> on almost every corner you know so it's very competitive really? market so it's, yeah. wow i was like interesting probably not the best idea but in the netherlands there's no i mean there were there are a few youtubers but they only speak dutch as well so there's no um yeah there's no really an, like an international youtuber for the aquarium hobby in the Netherlands. So I thought that was, that was a better option than opening a physical store and start selling fish or aquarium related products. Makes sense. So there's actually, so there's a, a good volume of stores there actually. I mean, it's, yeah. it's uh, wow. I mean, obviously I mean, the, the hobby has been huge there for, for, for a long time, decades, I know. And obviously we have the massive contribution to the hobby that, you know, the Dutch style aquarium, mm -hmm. which is one of the original styles. I mean, not a lot of aquarium categories sort of had a defined sort of regional. It may have been one of the, one of the only at the time there was never, no one ever said German style or American <laughs> style, but this Dutch style yeah. became a very specific thing. Were you ever involved in that in any kind of way? Did you ever do that style of aquarium at like growing up or anything or? No, no, not at all. Because I basically only found the the planted side of things in like 2015 or something. Before that, I was very much into uh, uh, cichlids. Okay. Yeah. Basically, growing up as a kid. Well, I was going to say what we would call so this Dutch style aquarium, which seems like something that uh, it, obviously it has a there's a cultural sort of roots to it, but. It wasn't any, were you aware of it or just not into it? Or I'm just, I'm trying, I'm curious how sort of prevalent that is as a style or even in the Netherlands, is it have sort of its own following its own sort of subculture of people that do it? Um, I was definitely aware of it. Um, I remember as a, as a kid, I was subscribed to a, to a magazine and they would always uh, show pictures of these like 
really nice duck style aquariums. But I think, right. especially at that time, it was kind of considered a thing for old people as well. Okay, like uh, an older, uh, like a, like a style for the older generation. Okay. Um, but yeah, growing up as a kid, um, I basically learned the hobby from um, my father, my dad. He uh, he basically taught me everything, and he was really into Central American cichlids. And with him being your father, you kind of want to follow in his footsteps, right? Like sure. do the things that he's doing, and yeah. So yeah, naturally, I was I started with cichlids, cichlids as well, but it was only until I like moved out of the house that I found the uh, the planted tank hobby, and that's uh, now looking back at it, this suits me much more than cichlids. Sure. What was do you do you recall sort of what your gateway or what that when you discovered it was it by way of just things you saw online? Did it happen to be? you know, Mr. Amano's work or, uh, do you kind of remember that aha moment by, by chance? Uh, not exactly. I mean, um, I moved out and I, uh, I rented a little apartment together with my girlfriend and I mean, we were only together for, for a year. So I didn't want to like, like bombard my, uh, bombard my hobby on her, you know, like, Hey, we're going to set up a, <laughs> a four foot tank, in you know, a little studio apartment. Trust me, I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I just bought a little uh, nano cube, and I was like, "Okay, what can I, what can I do in this small space?" You know, I mean, can't keep cichlids in there, right? So I think indeed I just started going online and it's like, "What can I do with a nano cube?" And somehow, indeed, I managed to find Damano's work. I think George was also one of the first ones I started watching. Sure. So that's kind of how the the ball started rolling. Yeah. Then you just start to see sort of what's possible. And um, obviously that you can do this very effectively in smaller aquariums, I think is just yeah. huge. Um, I've seen repeatedly in your content that sort of shelf display. That you keep <laughs> a lot of, you know, there's like, <laughs> there's... I don't yeah, know exactly like how popular. many aquariums are on there, but yeah. But you know, this expands small spaces into uh, something I'm talking about all the time because I think it's just the coolest thing. You know, kind of the home studio, the home gallery kind of mm -hmm. vibe. Um, and I think that, that I, and I'm sure you've, you know, discovered this in your content that that kind of exposure uh, is, I think it's just great for the hobby because it just, it shows people that, you can do really amazing things, even in small aquariums. I watched uh, one of your more recent videos uh, last night on the, it was the, the big cylinder, uh, the big vase that yeah, you got that you big did vase. No filter <laughs> style in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. It's deceptively large, actually. I was like, wow, that's 40 centimeters tall. But um, yeah, it is. And that, that, yeah. So I was definitely very curious about that because you know you seem to have that down and i have no success i have just no success no game whatsoever when i try this no filter style um really? i just get into kind of a cloudy water kind of a um always have an oily film on top um it's just nothing i've ever and i you know and i'm probably throwing in the towel you know giving up on it a little too soon because I, I'm just my OCD tendencies about things are probably kicking in. But um, <laughs> is that it, it? And it looks like, and when I look back, it's something you'd actually done before too. And so even keeping, like in in the cylinder, I saw you you had a Blixa japonica, for example, which is yeah. a plant I would think would surely not do well in such a thing. But uh, I mean, cl clearly there's a uh, there's a possibility there. I mean, this, this works. I've seen some of the Japanese, uh, are obviously some of the highest level of this bowl style where they take the fish bowl and do the very, very intricate layouts in there. But they're, when you look at their how to's and this kind of thing, when they lay that out, it's quite a process. I mean, it, it takes some time for all that to reach that very idyllic, uh, state. But kind of what, what you were doing to me looked 
rel it looked nice on day one and it, and it appears to be something that's that's got quite a foundation to it um do you see that as just kind of no big deal really like it, the the no filter stop because those as you've seen those get a lot of views uh, people see no filter and they're going oh boy hey wait a minute yeah <laughs> i'd love yeah. to do that you know uh what what can you tell me about the no filter style from your experience um yeah i mean personally i'm a i'm a big fan of of, of high tech things i mean i love getting the the best growth out of plants with good fertilizers good co2 and everything but this no filter style is indeed is a nice kind of change of things as well because you, sometimes you need to just mix it up a little bit um and indeed it, it's something that is sort of relatively easy for people to replicate maybe not easy but somehow people indeed really enjoy this style and it always gets a lot of views um and in terms of i don't it's not like i do anything really different with these no filter styles i mean i just use exactly the same um the same substrate and the same yeah i think i think the key to a successful no filter tank is just a lot of plants just lots of plants in there and i think with a no filter no filter aquarium you will never get the same clarity in water clarity as with a, uh, a filter aquarium of course and like you mentioned the the biofilm I can see it from here. I think there's still there's a little bit of biofilm on there as well. Right. Yeah. These are just kind of things you have to. Uh, They're just things you got to manage, or you got to kind yeah. of lean into the imperfection side of it in some kind of way. I think is yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. probably the takeaway there. So, but your exactly your system board or how you treat it is very similar to how you would do a high tech tank. I mean, there's not a big difference in sort of the overall sequence that you're following. No, it's just um, um, aquasol as a substrate. I'm actually curious for myself too, because I, you know, it's something I'm, I'm going. Okay, I gotta, I gotta crack the code on this because, and I again, I probably get a little frustrated too soon. My expectations are of the kind of result you get, obviously, with the high tech, you know, sequence and good CO2 and the robust filtration, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so. When you, when you were first getting started, I mean, you, you came to it as far as aquascaping anyway, which is clearly your focus. Um, did, were you able to find a pretty clear formula or sequence or, you know, from the, and I, I'm always curious about this too, because people that are able to access this now with the amount of information out there uh, YouTube videos and, you know, lots of content. Um, did you feel like you fell into a pretty clear formula for how to aquascape? Because you've probably, I'm, I, I imagine you've found that, that it is a, there is sort of a sequence to it. I mean, regardless of the layout style, the sequence that you follow in terms of how you set up the filter, uh, water changes, you know, the technical side of it, is pretty consistent from layout to layout to layout. What's different is your ex expression, your creativity in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and was was that, did you face many challenges in sort of sorting that out or were you able to find kind of a pattern to follow pretty early on? I mean, I think in a way, I, of course, I already had quite a good um, like base knowledge because I, I was already in the hobby for, for a while. And I mean, doing water changes, yeah, that's something I was already used to. Um, and I think indeed when I started, there was already quite a lot of uh, information available. But it's it's with everything, you know, like, um, I always say, like, what works for somebody can might not work for you as well. Because, I mean, the, the videos that I was watching, for example, and the person would tell me that I need to dose fertilizer every single day. And then I would do that. I would dose fertilizer every single day and I would get a bunch of algae, for example, you know, right. something like that. Yeah. Um, so there was quite a lot of information available from the beginning. And I think it was quite easy to get started as well. But of course, you, you, you face your challenges. Um, and I think that's just a sort of like a, a phase that you need to go through 
I mean, nobody's going to set up their first planted tank or the first aquascape and going to have immediate success. Right. You need Unless, to pick, yeah. you need to figure out you need to figure out LG and how to just deal with it, how to prevent it, and that's just a learning phase, you know. It's true. It's true. Though sometimes they do have success very early on. And it's, I'm sure you've encountered this in your experience now with so many different layouts. Sometimes things happen that just can't be explained. Things go in a certain kind of way, even when they shouldn't, or it feels like something, uh, a random combination of things. And, you know, the aquarium is, is never getting algae. It's, it's just, the water's always clear. Plants are growing well. And maybe right next to it, even, you may have a layout with the exact same sort of approach, you know, every, the system is the same and this one's doing a very different thing. You know, we've all, yeah. I think once we've done more than a few tanks, I think that's something we often observe. And, uh, sometimes I know when people are, are newer to it, they will have a certain kind of success right away, but maybe not, rem not understanding that there's kind of a random element to it. And, I always joke sometimes, well, then they make a YouTube video of it <laughs> and this goes out to the world as the new successful formula, you know, uh, and you're going, wow, look what they did. And yeah. I Let me try say, that well, as well. right. Do it a second time. Do it a second time. Uh, yeah. and that, that's, that's why I always am curious about the question about kind of those, what it looks like for someone coming into this in an age where all that information is out there and there may even be too much sometimes, or, you know, obviously there's been a lot posted that didn't show a complete, it wasn't presented as even sort of a systematic way to do things. And I can see from your content that you're, you know, you've, you've got what I kind of call, a, I just curse me as like a flow. You got a flow to it in the sense that one video to the next one, there's a certain continuity to the aesthetic, but over, more than that, sort of how you're showing your sequencing of how to do layouts is is concise and it's consistent. And I just think I think that's of immense value because it can show people again that it's it's just like that. You know, it's more recipe at the foundational level. I mean, do, what do you what do you think when you see like? Um, Okay, so now there's this dark start. Are you familiar with the dark start method? Is sort of, yeah, of I'm, I'm having now a lot of customers come into my store and they're ask, asking, they've never set up a planted tank and they already know about dark start. <laughs> <laughs> so have you experimented with that at all? Uh, it, do you kind of get into these, trying these things, dry start, dark start, these things that are trying to be sort of a little bit, maybe a, of a, there could be a real solution there, but they might just be someone trying to kind of hack the sequence a little bit what, what are your do you mess with that when you see it you go i need to try that um dark start i actually made a made a video about it so maybe some oh, of cool. your your customers are coming <laughs> from my, right. see my video and then they're coming to the, <laughs> right yeah um yeah I've, I've definitely tried the dark start more so in a way that um i was just ready with the hardscape i was just waiting for for plants and thought you know what might as well fill the tank up and, and get the cycle going. Sure. Um, but I mean, in a way, I think the dark start is a, is a, is a good method because, um, I think especially for, for people who are relatively new to the hobby and they might not be aware of how many water changes they actually need to do with a ADA Amazonia substrate, for example. And if they, would use the dark start, then all of those excess nutrients can kind of leak out into water column. Then they can do a massive water, hundred percent water change, plant it. And then it might be a little bit easier to, to get started, you know? So sure. I, I do believe the dark start is, has its, its use in some way. You saw, you experienced some advantages from it, uh, in terms of maybe like, yeah. Was it curing the wood a bit ahead of time, this kind of thing. Um, exactly. Because I, I think often the, the in wood-based scapes, 
the wood is a massive contributor to just overall organics and just the, 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 the deterioration of the overall water quality. The wood contributes to that, I think, more than, than is realized sometimes. Um, so it, totally. it does make sense uh, from that from that standpoint, I can see where that would be advantageous. Um, I guess I always thought that maybe leaching stuff out or trying to get the soil to calm down was maybe less of an advantage, but I can see where then too, yeah, you're skimming some of the excess off of there. I came from, you know, more the hundred percent Amano way of doing mm -hmm. it. And so I probably get yeah. stuck sometimes in the, well, Mr. Amano, Never did a dark start. Why should I? Uh, which is not good thinking, right? I mean, this the we, the, the the approaches can evolve as we go, and uh, you know, it's something where I probably was too stuck in a certain kind of way of, of doing it. Um, again, it's just what piques my curiosity about people that have access to these strategies and things now, and if they go, wow, okay. I mean, did it make you go? I'm going to do dark start. Now, anytime I have wood layout, or was it not that profound for you in terms of kind of the your core sequence of a of, of a new layout? No, 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 no. Um, going back to what you just said, and about kind of being being stuck in your ways, I think for me, I was always trying to find ways to make it easier for people who are new to the hobby, because I don't know. My goal was kind of to have as many people succeed with the zombie so the zombie can grow bigger. Sure. So if I can find hacks, then, then yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make a video about it, you know? Um, but it's no, I definitely don't use the, the dark start. I actually rarely do. Okay. I'm a, I'm a big fan of just planting heavy from the, from the start and just using some floating plants, for example, to soak up some of these excess nutrients. So that's an actual strategy that you use that you'll go ahead and, because they can be so easily removed yep. after the fact. Because um, when you say plant heavily, and that because that's been around a long time, for obvious reasons, the plant's obviously dealing with those excess nutrients in the new layout. But I've always said, well, what about when we do Iwagumi? Or, you know, what about when we do a <laughs> uh, very minimalistic scape? You know, that. Um, but again, for somebody just starting out, I, I too always say, well, your first layouts are probably better, more heavily planted because of the challenges of more minimalistic planting, um, which obviously, you know, makes total sense. But uh, yeah, interesting. It didn't, it didn't occur to you as something so profound that you're going, okay, every time I have heavy wood layout, now I'm doing dark start. But uh, so it's another tool to have in the toolbox, I guess is probably the best way to look at that. Um, you ever done the dry start approach? Uh, and doing a, doing a dark start for me also wouldn't really make sense uh, content wise because then it would take me first of all three weeks to I would make a video, then do the hardscape, and then wait three weeks before I can continue with the video again. So it, it also wouldn't make sense content wise. It's part of why I avoided it too the waiting period. Exactly, exactly. Dry start. I have actually done quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, but just for moss, it's okay. kind of a, a thing that I had a while back. Um, like you used to make a nice hardscape layout. And then I was a big fan of Fissidens, Fissidens moss. Yes. Love it. So I would like brush the, uh, uh blitz the Fissidens in like, uh, water or, um, I say it like milk, something like that. So you make like a moss smoothie. Kind of, yeah, the slurry of it. Slurry, paint that on the hardscape. You can do that with the Fissidens, right? Yeah. Okay. I love cool. doing that. Yeah. So I'm curious about that as far as we need, because lately I'm doing a lot of moss. Uh, I'm The style where I do more intense hardscape and less soil or sometimes no soil approach. Mm -hmm. You know, I call it greening, but that's just so I can talk about it with people as a distinctive style. It's not really, the rest of the world has not embraced this, this title of greening doesn't mean anything, but, um, when there's a no soil, but a lot of hardscape, and then I'm just going to use epiphytes. Uh, that's, that's 
what I call greening, but um, often a lot of moss in that kind of scape. And so you mentioned using the dry start for, for mosses. Is that, are you finding that that gets, that's helping them get just a better established growth because the new moss and a new layout, you know, it can take quite a while for it to get nice, you know, to get like you want it to be growing, uh, especially with the tissue culture mosses I'm finding, uh, they may grow kind of strangely at first, and then you're having to trim them or thin them out a lot and to get it where it's just growing nice and tight on the wood, for example, can, it's a little different process, like with the tissue culture moss, which is predominantly what I'm using these days. But did you find that the, does the dry, is there some specific dry start advantages with mosses that you found? Mm, I don't think there was really advantages. I think it was kind of a, a phase that I had where I really enjoyed doing that. Um, I think what I liked about this dry start moss method was and you could really, really get a good spread without having to need a lot of moss, for example. And if you have a, a pot of tissue culture moss, like you would split into portions and then you have like patches, patches here and there. And I really enjoyed this, like covering the <laughs> half the layout in, in moss. So then doing this slurry was very efficient as well. So doing the slurry with the dry start though, there's so kind of a growth uh does it grow in better or once you do flood the tank is there having done the moss ahead of time in the dry start that's what i'm i'm actually just personally curious about that because i do a lot of those kinds of layouts i'm going okay wait a minute maybe i need to think about that approach more was it something you just were doing or were you doing it for a, a, a better outcome when you started up the tank in terms of how the moss was growing or whatever no, I think it was purely just to uh, to do something different because okay. it's not something that a lot of people were doing. And yeah, mostly just to kind of avoid having this the patchiness, just okay. like a random. Because during the dry start period, then the moss is starting, you're getting actual growth. It's starting to look nice while still, in the, in, while still covered and not yet flooded. You're getting a, a nice appearance from moss over some days? Mm, yes and no. I mean, I was mainly using this method, using this method with Fissidens and I would do it for three, maximum four weeks. And during the time it wouldn't really grow that much, okay. but just, just enough. So it's attached to the hardscape. So once, once you flood the tank, it's okay. I see. Right. So you flood the tank and now it's, it's, you didn't do any, you didn't attach it with thread or glue. You didn't have to do that. You kind of, you made the, you made the smoothie and spread yeah. that onto the hardscape and then covered exactly. it. Exactly. So, okay, now I get it. What you're getting, the advantage you're getting from the dry start is the uh, attachment at three, four weeks or so. So when you yeah, flood exactly. it, it's, it's growing, it's already attached to the wood in some kind of way. Yeah, exactly. And then you're not having to use glue and, and thread. Right, like that. right. No, that's, that's very useful. That's, that's very useful because yeah, the, not a huge fan of the glue with moss either. It's, um, no, y even if now that have you seen these colored glues, do you ever work with those? There's a brown and there's black and there's, you know, there's, yeah, the, I, really? this is fairly, yeah, fairly new to me. Uh, our new favorite okay. thing is, um, and maybe it's something I can put in the, uh, links, uh, yeah. in, in the, on the, on the video portion of this, but. Yeah, so just look them up. They're out there. There's a uh, black, there's a brown, uh, and they, they there's certain times if you use it very heavily, more so the brown will mm -hmm. still get a little bit of, of a kind of a crust to it, that white crust, not nearly as much as just regular glue gets, which obviously that's the big, all these little patches of seeing the crust uh, you know, the moss is going to grow over it. It's, it's going to lose it over time, but I just, I just don't like it. I don't like it at yeah. all, you know, but, um, yeah, there's these colored, uh, cyanoacrylates, uh, out there now, uh, we use the, Interesting. the black and the, and the black and the brown quite a lot. The, the black one tends to really not, 
get crusty at all. I mean, it dries, it dries black. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm gl glad I was actually to contribute a, a tip to this conversation too. <laughs> Uh, cause no, it's good. I, I was even wondering, it's like, why, you know, this, this is bound to catch on pretty soon. I think right yeah. now the, you know, those are more marketed in the hob hobbies, crafts kind of, uh, sort of industries and hasn't found its way over to the aquarium side though. I, I would bet the, uh, wouldn't be surprised if some of the Indonesian scapers already know about this because these guys are masters with the glues and the techniques for you know, how they put their hardscapes together. They're on a completely different level. You were, totally. And I, I think a lot of the, the origins of these using a different adhesives and those techniques probably predominantly, they were probably the real pioneers of that style because, you know, I remember just being blown away by the hardscapes and stuff going, wow, you know, wait, how do you, you know, this was probably back when I first started seeing that style. I don't know what your response to it was, but you know, I thought, how the heck did you, because I had no idea really of using any kind of adhesives or things like that. Uh, do you do hardscaping with, is that something that's piqued your interest at all in terms of these more intricate hardscape possibilities you can do when you start gluing things together? I mean, I do use glue in my in my layouts, um, but just because I'm I'm too lazy to pre-soak any wood, something like that. Uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, in terms of hardscapes, uh, I like to keep my hardscapes quite simple. I think for me, I'm a, I'm more of a plant enthusiast more than a hardscape enthusiast. So I'll, I usually keep my hardscapes quite simple. Use a little bit of glue here to make sure that everything nothing's going to float up right but in general yeah i'm more of a i'll spend more time selecting the plants for my layout and i'll be busy with our escape in general yes no I, I i tend to be that way too um recently in the uh in the gallery i it was really honestly the first time in all these years i had a, another staff member do a layout and he's you know quite a young guy and i saw it yeah. So he comes from a different set of influences, really, which I find very interesting. And um, now this was the idea going in was to do a more, a lot of glue kind of layout. Let's just say that, you know, uh, we were mm -hmm. actually trying to facilitate a lot of the broken pieces you get at the bottom of a pallet of, of driftwood or, or this kind of thing. So this was just a spider wood. And, you know, we're just trying to use up pieces that if you looked at them by themselves, wouldn't be very interesting to aquascape with, but obviously if you could put them together, uh, you know, what could you do with it? So I don't think he used a single piece that on its own was attractive. Uh, but by gluing it all together, he, he made a, this very elaborate structure. Looks amazing. Yeah. It's a whole different vibe. Um, and I guess the possibilities and the way we create the depth and it, it vibes to me a little more like the contest. What I would just think of now in my head, I go, oh, that's contest style, <laughs> whatever, yeah, exactly. whatever that means. I don't think it's a firm category, but you know, so much of the winning uh, contest scapes have that intense heart. You're imagining there was probably some tricks involved in getting the hardscape to where it's at. Um, do you follow the contest stuff? Do you keep up with that? Is that something, What what's your interest level in that realm of aquascaping honestly very little um i mean i've i've done a few contests have i yeah i've participated once or twice in like a sort of local dutch contest sure but like the online like iaplc um aquatic gardens association i've never participate in that i might in the future but sure. um it's it's difficult to participate in contests when your main focus is content creation because yeah there's rules that's true yeah and when you're when i know when you're making a lot of content and that's that's a focus you know every project becomes relevant 
towards the content creation side. So yeah, it's like, yeah. wow, am I going to have a time to make a whole contest scape? Keep it hidden. Yeah, you know, I can't use this for content because it can't be shown ahead of time, et cetera. Um, no, I totally get that. That 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 makes sense. And it's a funny thing. It's a question I often ask, just because I'm curious. You know, uh, always what the real perception is at more the hobby level. Are we influenced by what we see there? Or are we just doing our own thing? You know, this this kind of stuff because it definitely it drives a lot of interest when people see those amazing scapes but um i think often the takeaway is that it's it's become something for the contest a little too specifically um i don't know if you've ever seen any of these layouts in person or even just a video of them sometimes and you go okay well this it it looks a little odd <laughs> in person not all of them, yeah. you know, but sometimes there's, there's, the, you know, what they're doing isn't, uh, it's made for that one angle. Of course, I know a lot's been said about that already, but, um, I'm always just curious other people's interpretation of it, but looks like your style, the, the word that, you know, you like a layout that breathes a little bit. Um, so maybe less focus on intense hardscape. And like you said, you're more of a, more into the plants which I think there's just a ton of interest in. I think I think a lot of people respond to that too. I think keeping it simple is also um, better for my audience. I mean, if I would make these really complicated hardscapes um, that is very difficult for other people to copy. Um, I'm sure that, of course, people might be still watching, but yeah, I think it's more fun if people can, if I'm showing things that other people can actually do as well, you know? Right. And if I'm only showing um, 120Ps with, uh, I don't know, like 40 kilos of uh, Sirius Stone and like 3,000 pieces of red more wood. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's kind of my It's angle. not super accessible. Sure. No, I totally get that. Um, so I am uh, intrigued. It keeps coming back into my brain here about the number of shops that you have there in Netherlands. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so more people have an aquarium in their home. I mean, obviously to support that, but it's just aquarium ownership there just more common. I mean, somebody just has a, they're not necessarily a serious hobbyist. They're probably not consuming a lot of online content, but it would it just be more commonplace to have an aquarium in the home? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I mean, Indeed, like just in the grammar, it's not like we have a ton of aquascaping specialist shops in the Netherlands. I think we actually only have like one or two. Okay. But we do have like a lot of pet shops that have an aquarium department or just, yeah, aquarium specialist shops that just sell everything for every part of the hobby, you know? Right. But yeah, I, I definitely think it's, it's more common in the Netherlands to have an aquarium at home or maybe just. Yeah, I'm not. Don't want to say Euro, but I mean in Germany. The hobby is very popular, of course, in the Netherlands as well. Yeah, maybe we, maybe we kind of got it from the Germans. Okay, yeah, because it's you know just the scene here in the U.S. is um, at the volume level. You know, not at the hobby level is you know this uh, it, that it's a substantial part of the market, but outside of the hobby, you know, people. I call them aquarium lover, not aquarium hobbyist. So all hobbyists, <laughs> may, all hobbyists may be lover, but not all lover is are hobbyist. The aquarium lover is just somebody who would just love to have an aquarium in their space or in their life, in their home, in some kind of way, and they know how to keep it well. But you know, they're not uh, they're not guys like like us or uh, you know, passionate, all consuming, you know, focus of our of our life kind of thing. Nerds. Right? Yeah, total nerds. They're not a nerds. They're just keeping, <laughs> they're just enjoying an aquarium. And I think that's so cool. Um, yeah. And that when it's just a natural thing uh, to have, or it's just more commonplace, it's not like, oh, you have an aquarium or you have it because you're so super passionate about it. Um, but that comes from resources. So uh, that just piqued my interest right away when you said, you know, there's, there's a lot of shops there, though not 
aquascaping specific, which I sort of find interesting because I figured on the freshwater side over there, um, the availability of plants, for example, um, I'm sure even these non aquascape specific shops, you know, they're not a specialist shop, but they're probably stocking a lot of good plants there. Yeah, yes for no? sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So if yep. you, when you need plants for an aquascape, your access to them is, uh, pretty good. I mean, if you don't find what you're looking at for it in one shop, you could just go down to the next one. It's not going to take all afternoon to get there and they probably have it there. Does it work kind of like that there? Um, kind of. Yeah. I do have to say that, uh, I get most of my plants online. Okay. Um, we, we have like a lot of online, online retailers as well. So I would indeed, I could just spend a couple hours, like trying to get my plant list together for this specific aquascape mm -hmm. and I'll go to one shop to see if they have everything that I need. If not, I'll go to the next one just until I can <laughs> make sure that I get my entire order from one specific shop and I don't have to like get to like three or four different shops just to get my plant order complete, you know? Sure. So you've got a good mix of online and retail stores to acquire plants, which I think is, uh, we, we might be a little envious of that in the U S for, because for a whole bunch of reasons, that's, that's less the case here. Um, so I'm always fascinated in markets where. Again, you've got great access to those important resources uh, relative to the size of the country too, to have that many shops. And like you mentioned, a lot of online availability is pretty cool. I know you, I was watching your video where you referenced a online seller that also has the shop that's open on Saturdays. Uh, they're only open yeah. Saturdays, but you, then you can go in and actually shop in the store. Look like a, an amazing shop store actually forwarded that video to my brother, Mike also said, Hey, you know, just a cool example of a shop there. It's kind of a cool concept to the online thing. And then with a little bit of retail access, but, yeah. um, but the website itself, when I checked it out was, uh, was impressive. I mean, it was definitely something, it gave me a sense that there's good demand, uh, there within the Netherlands then I guess relative to the size, you know, um, it's probably bigger than, than we think, or, um, you said it's, it's true. Your neighbor, you can't go talk to your neighbor about aquascaping. Usually. It's a small community in that sense, but, um, it's cool to know that there's a pretty robust scene there. You know, do you have many other people that you associate with or like clubs or friends or other uh, sort of, sort of aquascaping colleagues there in your immediate community or just in the Netherlands in general? Honestly, no, not really actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I can count them in, in with one hand. Okay. With the Dutch style, what we call the traditional Dutch style, I, I thought it was cool. <laughs> it's sort of just funny that you, this is like an old guy style, <laughs> which is funny because <laughs> You know, I wouldn't up, offend anybody. No, no, no. It's true. I mean, as you know, you, certain things are going to have a certain appeal to different kinds of uh, demographics or, or age groups, et cetera. It's totally fine. Um, it's just funny because I, uh, in the '90s, you know, obviously there there wasn't even any many magazines with much planted tank content and this sort of thing. But uh, my brother and I already owned a tropical fish store uh, in the early '90s, and so we were just. No, we didn't know about aquascaping either, but we knew about planted aquariums entirely from Europe. You know, all the cool, anything cool was coming from Germany. And then there was, of course, Dutch style. And uh, one thing you could find was content or, you know, information in a book or a magazine about a Dutch style. And I always noticed it was kind of an older, <laughs> usually an older gray haired gentleman who was uh, keeping the aquarium and always had a very... I guess it's a thing to have it um, in a very elaborate, like the cabinetry and all of this seemed to be a big part of it. I mean, these look like full installations in the home, uh, not a freestanding, you know, certainly no rimless tank in that age, but not even a trimmed tank. These were always a very nice, look like a, a, a master cabinet maker had 
installed them in the home, this kind of thing. Um, does that seem pretty correct with, with your, your awareness of the Dutch style? Yeah, totally. Uh, I think in a way, um, the style, me referencing that it's for old people, I think it's also because it, to do a Dutch style properly is a lot of work as well, because they don't just trim the plants. They literally rip them all out and then cut them all to size and then plant them back. So they always remove the entire root system and then just plant the tops back. And they do that with every trimming session. Wow. Very gardening, more of a gardening yeah, really. approach. Exactly. I could see it would, there's a time element there that, you know, a, a person at the height of their career and very busy with family and other things yeah, probably wouldn't logically have time to, to really do. It's something that this is like, I wouldn't. He's a retired Dutchman and is has the the time to be around the house and uh work on the Dutch style tank. It makes sense. I know too they I don't know if this is still uh the way it's done, but you know, now for Dutch style and I think it's where a mono probably got the original idea for a contest, but the the competition side of it if there's a layout competition uh sort of origins i know the dutch style that was a thing for for for, for decades now um and i always understood it that they the judges would actually visit the aquarium in person um yeah. to make to make the judging and the assessment of it is that still go, going on today i hadn't really looked into that in so long yeah, that's still that's still exactly the way it is. I think there's um, there's need like smaller clubs throughout the entire country, and then there's one sort of organization that indeed um, has uh, a couple of judges, and they indeed travel the whole country to visit um, these tanks and these people and judge them in real life. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine the modern aquascape <laughs> contest working this way? Obviously, you couldn't do it with thousands of entries, but um, I don't know. I think it would be sort of interesting. I, I've always thought that maybe a uh, there should be a a video submission as part of. So it's not just the one photo, um, but rather you have a you have something that's showing a little more of the angles and the dimension of the tank and. Uh, you know, you don't have to get into sort of how it looks in a room or, uh, you know, that sort of aesthetic side, but just where we, if we could see the layout from some, a few other perspectives and, you know, this could even, this could be 20 seconds of, of video, you know, maybe how the fish are moving because some of these escapes, quite frankly, in the contest, I'm like, I have to look for the fish. <laughs> Is there even fishes in this thing? You know? um, but yeah, I wonder, did you, you, you feel like that would be do that that might give us more of a sense of the reality of the aquarium i guess is what i'm what i'm sort of getting at since we couldn't go there in person like they do with the dutch style judging um maybe a video element no, i bring this up because mark honestly i'm always i'm i I feel like the only one saying these things sometimes and so i'm trying to get other people if they're on board because if it became more of a i think if it spread you know, if the influencers and the creators were sort of pointing to these kinds of things that maybe the contest organizer, I think it'd be very novel for the, be the first contest organizer to include a short video component of the layout. I think it would create a lot of additional interest. Uh, I remember last year there was a, uh, a contest. I think it was organized by... Um the Spanish ADA distributor. Okay. And he organized his contest for the first time that year. And indeed, I think um, if you would enter the contest, you could get, could extra, get extra points if you indeed um, submitted like a short video or like different angles as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was, I think that was indeed the first time that I heard something like that. But I mean, to answer your question about um, seeing videos need, for example, in the IOPLC. That would definitely make it more real. 
because like you said earlier, I mean, it's all comes down to that one moment, that one picture. And yeah, I mean, if you would catch that tank in any other day of the week, it might look completely different. Right. So yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely like to see that as well. Yeah. I just think that, you know, it's, uh, it's just speaks more to what we, how one experiences an aquarium anyway. I, I can understand back in the early days, just the ability to capture video, very limited, um, server space you're trying to upload all these videos you know that was all all these were challenges that i don't think we there's not even a consideration anymore i mean everybody has a 4k camera in their pocket for the most part not exactly. everybody but but most most people have access to to at least hd level uh filming you know rather easily um yeah that's uh i don't know it's just something i'm i've been trying to kind of create a little of a conversation around because I, I'm dying to, sometimes I look at the contest scape and I'm, I'm just dying to see it in action, you know? Um, and now with reels and, uh, kind of taking over the Instagram approach and all of that, you know, the idea of video clip is clearly in much more demand now than just the still photo. Um, so I don't know, something I thought would be kind of cool. Yeah, and, and I mean, in terms of content, there's a lot of content out there in terms of simple layouts. But in terms of these really high-end layouts, there's very little content on, on YouTube, for example. Maybe a little bit more on Instagram, but video content about high-level aquascapes is still very rare. That's a good point, actually. I think that's a good point. Yeah, I, that's true. And I, I sometimes will search for that. And, and have a hard time finding it could be too uh, minimal demand. I think I think content like you're creating has a much broader audience because obviously the overwhelming majority of people would love to have a nice, simple aquascape uh, in their home. And I think that's really the that's the value that that channels like yours are bringing. And whereas you have to be pretty hardcore. You got to be pretty serious to uh, be wanting to sit and watch intensive gluing and all this sort of thing. A few guys, I, I've seen a few of them, and um, usually it's the Indonesian scapers because uh, these guys are yep. they're serious about it. You know, it's really uh, they've taken it to a whole nother level. You see these events that they'll have. Sometimes this is just set up for a weekend, um, yeah. you know, just a seminar convention or whatever this event is that they're doing. And there's this whole room full of maybe like 60 P as far as the eye can see <laughs> exactly. all the guys making very high level scapes, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive. It's cool. Um, in terms of, uh, hardscape availability there in the Netherlands, is that, do you have some pretty good spots where you're able to acquire most of that? Um, is that something that's pretty abundant there or is it still a struggle to, do you end up looking at a lot of hardscape but not finding a lot of quality pieces or what's that resource like for you there? I think in general, we, uh, we have a pretty good selection in most shops. Um, I mean, when it comes to hardscape, I always, I mean, I never buy hardscape online, never, but rarely ever, because you always kind of want to see it with your own eyes, you know? Right. Um, there are a few online shops that literally take pictures of every single piece of hardscape that they have available. So that will make it a little bit easier. But um, yeah, in, in general, I always prefer to go to a shop, play in a dojo and buy a hardscape there. But, yeah, I mean, I just told you that we have a lot of aquarium shops in the Netherlands, but then again, uh, where I live, there's actually not that much. Okay. So like in Amsterdam, for example, in Amsterdam, for example, there's, I think there's one or two pet shops. They have very, very little hardscape there, just very little aquarium stuff in general. So if I have to, if I want to get some hardscape, I always definitely have to like travel a little bit, you know, 
like go to a good quality shop like the ones that you, the video that you saw that one for example sure but um yeah in general we have quite a good selection definitely you ever travel out do you ever travel outside of the country or around other parts of europe or go to germany or other places where you know there might be big stashes is that uh something you've ever done or considered doing kind of a hardscape um, tour. could be a cool video actually hardscape uh, tour yeah. yeah doing like a hardscape tour you travel around i'm always i'm envious of a european situation where you can pop around to different countries relatively easily you know and kind of explore but but, the, but have their own distinctive uh sort of flavor or vibe um I don't know. Could be an interesting, could be a cool. I I I'd watch that video. I mean, I think I think stuff like that's really neat. And then other people too. Then they just they're going, oh man, this guy gets to travel all over and get all this great hardscape, and I've got my one bed shop here in the, in this, in this city or whatever. But uh, is there anything you've ever done, or do you ever uh, think about? Mm. Man, they may have a great. Let me go. Like, where's Oliver getting all of his stuff or whatever? <laughs> yeah. No, I think yeah, um, in that sense, I think we have a good, a good selection here, and that it's not necessary for me to travel anywhere else just to pick up our skip. Of course, I love traveling and and seeing other um, crime shops in 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 different countries. You know, it's always always fun to do. But usually, I will also travel by plane and stuffing my suitcase with rocks and wood. sure, but, right. Doesn't yeah, sound very I guess yeah. I guess driving around all that would be uh, that would be quite a quite an epic situation. That that would be a lot of logistics to sort out. Um, yeah, I guess I guess over there in the United States it's different because I mean just to go to a different um, different state, it's kind of like yeah, the Netherlands are moving to a different country, you know? Right. Sure. The only the only problem here is there's no you go to the other state and there's no. There's no great destinations there either for you know for hardscape and stuff. It's still very scattered here. There's just not a lot of um, the average tropical fish store. It's getting better. It's definitely improved, but the average fish store still doesn't have. They're not. They haven't embraced aquascaping. Maybe in the most necessary or most vital ways. Like the most vital way to me is hardscape and plants. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the two areas of sort of focus. The rest of it is equipment and hardware. And that's that's readily available anywhere. Or yeah. you can get it online very easily. But hardscape and plants, plants less so. But as you learned, you know, hardscape online is a challenge. And mm -hmm. uh, you got to see it. You got to get in the dojo. And I had a saying, you know, you don't aquascape by the pound. Or you don't aquascape by the, uh, um, why am I drawing a blank? Not You guys don't do pounds. It's uh, kilos. You don't aquascape by the kilo. <laughs> yeah. This is just not how it's done. And so it's sort of a comedy to me sometimes that there's, I'm seeing a stock photo of a Sirius stone on a website. And they're selling it by the pound. And I'm going, what, what on earth am I going to get, you know? Exactly. Did you have a period where you, I'm sure you tried that at some point, uh, and, and it just ended up going away. Oh, this isn't, did you have that same outcome where it just wasn't useful what you received? Of course. Yeah. This is actually quite, quite recently. I, um, there was a website selling this, a, a small pack of like smaller pieces of serious stone just, just for details, you know? Sure. It was a beautiful yeah. picture. Be beautiful picture on the internet and then you receive it and it's like they're all flat and there's no, no right. detail like right there's no there's no way yeah. you're selling barely useful for texture even even just for texturing you know it's yeah. yeah no it's 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 a challenge and that's uh it's just one of it's why i love talking to uh aquascapers and you know aquarium hobbyists from other countries because i'm i'm just fascinated at like how the market and the how it's different and then how it's similar the challenges that's that's faced in doing this for everybody and hopefully that that can lead to solving some problems um because if yeah if you can't you can be so inspired by what you're seeing online but if you can't go out and find those materials uh i mean what to do 
when now you've seen what's possible and yet what you have is uh no nowhere near that and you know i i see people they have the vision even if they had the resources but mm -hmm. on that same note it is i think it's improving it's getting better you're seeing more stores putting an emphasis on that um to where again you can even go into a store there that's not focused on aquascaping but they still are having good plants and some access to this stuff so and hey there's no way around it the the channels like yours and the content you're creating and that awareness um as you've seen i'm sure you're experiencing this you know that there's an influence there um influencer content creator there's a reason we use these terms you know so yeah um not so much influencer mostly content creator sure sure but at the same time yeah it's still exposing it to a huge market that creates demand and the more we have that demand the more the supply will follow I mean, that's just the way the world works it seems to be taking a little longer with aquarium for some reason but you know <laughs> <laughs> but it's moving in that yep. direction and that and that's that's gotta have patience yeah, yeah for sure for sure i think well, we Marcus, are indeed i think we in the netherlands in the netherlands and in europe in general we are a little bit spoiled sometimes and uh, i think we don't really realize that yes okay i only re i only realize I'm glad you said realize that. <laughs> i always realize it when i get when i post a video about a a shop tour for example right because 99 percent of the time there's always somebody commenting i wish we had shops like that in the united states <laughs> right okay always thanks for saying it for me uh you know <laughs> Because no, it's very true. And you know, it's funny because there's an I think there's a there's a notion worldwide that uh you know the U the uh, US is always has the the thing or we would have the most shops or the most stuff or whatever, but not not with aquascaping, less I mean the marine side of the hobby is definitely true. It's just abundant. In fact, the US is right at the top of you know just the innovations and the, the big brands and you know the us you know brands export a lot of the top end reef and marine tank products um but yeah the aquascaping is still a little slower to get going here and yeah it's we don't there's definitely not shops like that just just everywhere and so um even though you're in the netherlands and it's a different market so I wanted to have you on today is I, I, I love the approach and I think that there's a universal message there in your style and that's, it's inspiring people. And if nothing else, it's creating more awareness and more demand. And that's, what's going to lead to people going into that local shop and saying, Hey, where's the aquascaping stuff, you know? Um, and that's, goal. that's, that's great. Yeah, man. Well, Mark, it's been a fantastic conversation and, uh, I love what you're doing. I love the channel. Uh, we'll definitely have all the links there and everything else, but uh, keep up the work, man. I'm glad to see the the success with the channel and your philosophy and approach and your flow. You got a real flow, man, and, and uh, love to see it. So anyway, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was really nice talking to you. Maybe next time we should have a talk. Uh, face to face it's still on my bucket list to uh to travel to houston and visit adg oh, please do please very do. high on my bucket list yeah thank you so much man yeah we'd Maybe. love to have you absolutely For anytime sure. anytime okay awesome. man well thank you so much and look forward to talking to you again soon definitely